Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome back to our study today. And uh, we're thrilled that you've come to be a part of what we're learning in the book of Revelation. Uh, we are nearing about halfway through our study. Um, that's kind of crazy. We're, we're getting close to that. See the light at the end of the tunnel of the halfway mark. So thanks for being here. And let's pray. And then we're going to dive in tonight. Uh, Father, thank you so much for the uh, chance to once again dive into your word. And my prayer is that there would be clarity, that we would understand um, what this chapter is that we jump into here. I pray for open minds and the ability to comprehend, and your spirit can help us do that, Lord. It can help us understand in ways that we could not do on our own. So that's what I would pray for. I would ask that you would help me to say the right words and to explain it the right way, and that at the end of the game, when this lesson is over with, that we are um, more in line with your will for the future than maybe what we were when we started. So we give this to you. Thank you for the privilege to do it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I've got an old friend of mine who studied the book of Revelation with me a long, long time ago. And uh, when we were done with the 11th chapter, uh, my friend said to me, and I remember this, this quote, uh, he said, chapter 11 is the bomb. And uh, that was at a time where I wasn't sure what the bomb <laughs> metaphor meant. Um, I thought it had some kind of a negative connotation to it. Like, what's he calling this chapter the bomb for? Um, probably if back in those days, if, if one of my kids would have come up to me and said, hey, hey dad, you're the bomb. You are the bomb. I, I would have said, oh, yeah, really? And you're grounded for a month, too. How you like that bomb? But my, my friend explained to me that somewhere along the line, the bomb imagery kind of changed metaphor to a, a sign of good news, a praise, something that you would lift up. And so by calling chapter 11 the bomb, it was my friend's way of saying that this is the chapter that Christians should embrace. And, um, and man, I think that's an awesome way uh, to think about the lesson that we're about ready to jump into. Um, this is why it's a chapter of so many people who understand this book, and that is that it fits into the theme of, of the whole book, and that is this battle of good and evil and how that plays out in history, how God works in that, and ultimately how God and his people and the force of good that, that we come out on top. We win this thing. And so don't quit, you know, in the middle of it. Don't quit when it doesn't look good. Hang in there because we know the end of the game. We know that we win at the end of the game. And chapter 11 describes all of that. And uh, it does it in a wonderful way. There are ups and downs. It's like a roller coaster. There's times where uh, you will feel victory, and there's other times where you will feel uh, defeat. There's times when you will have hopeful anticipation. There's times when you may experience fear. You got, you got all that normal stuff that goes involved in a battle, a big battle. But at the end of the game, at the end of the game, we win. God wins, his children win, and so we're not going to quit until then. So chapter 11 just is a beautiful way to describe all that. And uh, because there's so much in this chapter, it will take us three lessons to get through the whole chapter. And so in this lesson, we're just going to look at the first six verses of Revelation 11. So let's jump into it. If you have a copy of Scripture, which I hope you do, um, why don't you uh, follow along with me, Revelation chapter 11, verse 1. I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and I was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar and count the worshipers there, but exclude the outer court. Do not measure it because it has been given to the Gentiles. And they will trample on the holy city for 42 months. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. 
If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes down from their mouths and devours their enemies. And this is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. These men have power to shut up the sky so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying. And they have power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. Okay, let's make some sense out of chapter 11 in these first six verses. Um, if, you have, um, if you've been with us for a while, you know that there's kind of a you kind of always try to pay attention to what's happening in the story. And that's why the book of Revelation is a really hard book just to, just to pull a verse out or, or a, a phrase or a paragraph and say, let's just look at that outside the context of the whole book. And we'll find that happening here in chapter 11 uh, really big. Um, let me set the stage for you in light of that. I, I was thinking when I wrote this about... The very first job that I can ever remember having, I delivered newspapers to houses. And one of my buddies, who's a little bit older than me, kind of had his own paper route, and uh, he had some of his friends help him. And so that was the very first uh, legitimately paid job I ever have. And uh, my buddy's name was Rick Nasser. I've lost track of Rick. I, I don't have no idea where he's at today. Um, but Rick was the guy who hired me. And I remember him saying um, that the two biggest challenges you'll have, it's crazy I remember this, was number one, people who don't pay their bill. And his solution to that was don't deliver papers anymore. You don't pay, you don't get a paper. Simple as that. The second biggest challenge are dogs. And dogs apparently like to uh, eat newspaper boys for dessert. And so Rick told me this. I, I remember him saying this, that if a dog comes after you, turn around and stand your ground. Don't move. Just stand there and stare at it and let them know you're not afraid of them. And eventually the dog will whimper up and go away. I can remember him telling me that. And I remember thinking, there is no way that is right. No way. And so dogs come, man, I am I'm running for my life. Well, here's what chapter 11 says. Rick was right. Rick was right. Sometimes you got to stand your ground, even if your opponent looks scary, even if you think... I'm going to get hurt in this situation. There are times when the force of evil rises and gets scary, and the force of good must stand up against that. You must stand up against that. And, and just by nature of me explaining that, you're, you're starting to get a feel for what this chapter is going to talk about because in your life and my life, there are times when our enemy, the devil, and all of his cronies and the force of evil in this world just seems like, man, I, I, don't, I don't know how I can go up against that. And, and I'm like, I'm, I'm running away from it like a, a, a scared newspaper boy and a ferocious dog. And, and chapter 11 says, stand up. Stand up and stare evil down. And evil will not defeat you, but you got to stand up. And that's the gist of this chapter. Now, John kind of unfolds it by describing for it uh, with us with, I think, some details that kind of, I'm, I'm going to show you three of these in particular. And these details kind of build on each other, and you'll see how this, this whole concept is taught here. Here's one of the details that I think I see in chapter 11 that we read, and that is that as we near the end of the age, as we near the end of the time, we, being the children of God, the people of God, the church, we will have incredible power. And that comes up several times in this section where John just kind of drives that point across that the people of God have this incredible power. And that's important for the context here. Because if you will remember, we are, 
We are in chapter 11, and chapters 10 and 11 are the interlude between the sixth and seventh trumpet. And I apologize for those of you who are just jumping into that because you're thinking, I don't know what that means. But if you're a veteran with us in this study, you know the sixth trumpet has been blown, the seventh trumpet is awaiting. So we are near the end of the world. We're near the end of the story here. And right before it, we've got this interlude, chapters 10 and 11. And chapter 10 presents that idea that as we get near the end of the world, the church, the followers of God, must proclaim that which is right and holy. That we don't cower in fear. We don't cower in fear. We stand up and we say, this is right and that's wrong. That we have to continue to proclaim that message as we near the end of the world. Now, when we get to chapter 11, as he's defining that, it's almost like a, a, a pep talk in halftime here where the coach says, you guys can do this. You can do this. You have an incredible power from God to make that happen. And you see him begin to allude to that. In the very first verse in the 11th chapter, he talks about going and counting the worshipers who are at the temple. Go count the people of God at the temple. Now that right there, kind of as a side note, is another reminder. This is not a literal book. The temple of God was destroyed in 70 AD. This book was written by John about 95 AD, about 20, 30 years later after the temple was destroyed, John writes the book. So how can he go count worshipers at a temple that no longer exists? That, it's, it's not a literal book. The worshipers at the temple are an image, a metaphor of the people of God the people of God at the end of the world, the followers of God, the church, go count them. Now, that, that's, that's an important point, I, I think, that I, I want to make sure that we understand here, that by measuring and counting, God is trying to present the idea that there is power in numbers when it comes to the children of God. That, that, I think that's an important thing for us to know, that both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, God often counts his people. He's interested in the numbers of his people who belong to him. And when those numbers increase, God takes incredible delight in that. Why is that? Because it's representative of of his strength, of his power on those people. I believe that's why every congregation, I, I believe this with all of my heart, have my entire ministry life as an adult, believe that there, there ought to be an, an emphasis in every single congregation on the number of people who are worshiping him, the number of people who are growing in Christ, the number of people who are serving him. I believe that's incredibly important. And if any congregation says those numbers just aren't increasing and becoming more and more powerful, that is an issue. That is a problem. But what we're told here is that as we near the end of the world, we're at the, the interlude between the sixth and the seventh trumpet, that there will be numbers of God's people that are counted. Now, that's an encouragement. That is an encouragement. If you have ever wondered, and man, lately we have, <laughs> What's going to happen to the church? As, as things just keep getting worse and worse, are, are we just going to kind of fade away? And is the power of God through the church going to weaken? Absolutely not. There will be a force of God's people at the end of time. Now, once he's kind of kind of brought that indication out, go count the worshipers at the temple. Go see the power of the children of God right now as we near the end of the world. He then kind of builds on that idea of power by describing two witnesses. And chapter 11 is the famous chapter that talks about the two witnesses. And the question is, who are the two witnesses. Now, there's a couple of different possibilities for this, and I want to I want to kind of suggest those to you. The idea of the two witnesses, the images, 
goes back to, and I just want you to write this text down, and you can look at it on your own. We're not going to read it. But it's Zechariah chapter 4, verses 2 through 14. And if you were to go back and read that passage, you will find that the image that is created in that passage is used by John right here. So when he wrote about the two witnesses and the two lampstands and the two olive trees, all of that comes from Zechariah 4. All of it comes from right there. And if you went back to Zechariah 5, 4, you know at that point that it referred to two very specific people who were key representatives of the force of good and God in the Old Testament, Zerubbabel and Joshua. Those were the two witnesses in, 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 uh, in Zechariah 4. So now we get to Revelation 11, and that image is given to us as we near the end of the time and the power of the church is there. We've got these two central figures. And some people believe, some interpreters believe that what we're being told there is that as we near the end of the time, there will be two representatives, real people on this earth, representative of the church of Jesus Christ that will just stand out, almost like Billy Graham type figures. And some people believe that's what we're being told. So watch out for who those two people were. I don't know if that's the meaning there. I, I don't know. The other interpretation of it is not that there's two specific representatives of God on this earth that kind of represent all the power of good on the earth, but it's more just a general understanding of the church, of all the children, all the redeemed of God are represented in these two figures. So it's not two people, it's just the whole of the church, the whole of the representatives. Now, I couldn't tell you. I, I don't know if it's specific or if it's more general. Um, there are strong arguments on both sides. But needless to say about it, I do think that the idea of it being the general representation of the church fits into the context of the story here, that we're being told that toward the end of time, the power of the church will intensify, it will grow, it will be very, very strong force. And you see the word power mentioned several times in those six verses. By the way, the word power that he uses here a number of times in those verses is not the normal word for power in the Greek language. Normal word for power, when you see it in the Bible, almost time it, it is the word dunamis which means we get our word dynamite power power dynamite that's not the word he uses he uses the word exousia which means authority the root of that idea is that when you have authority when you have exousia watch this there's nothing that you can't do when you have that authority and that power that exousia there are no things that are impossible. And so John is saying that will be the power of the church as we move along. So if you've ever wondered, man, are we going to be weakening as time goes along? Is the church going to be kind of wavering off in the... No! There will be a power among us, an incredible power. And he uses images of what their power would be. And uh, I love verse 5 as a preacher. I just love it. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. I like that. If there's a place that I wish uh, the book was literal, it would be right here. So you don't like my sermon? I breathe on you <laughs> and you're a goner. I love, but that's not what it means. He's not, he's not saying that the church has the, the power to tell it when to rain and not to rain or turn water into blood or those things kind of like that, uh, devastating plagues that he taught. Those are all metaphors that the church will be powerful. I think that's a great reminder of a verse in the New Testament I think every Christian ought to memorize. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. Dude, that ought to be on your refrigerator somewhere. 
the one who is in you is greater than the one who's in the world. That is a reminder that when you embrace Christ, when you give your life to Jesus and you are baptized as the moment everything begins to turn around, we are told that the Holy Spirit, the power of God, takes up residence inside of you. You become the indwelling tent of the power of God through the Holy Spirit. And John tells us in chapter 4, verse 4, that that which is inside of you is greater than that which is in the world, our enemy, the devil. You are more powerful than Satan. And John is reminding us of that right here, is that is the power of the church as we move to the end of the time. And so what John is telling us is that during this interlude, when evil and good is battling each other, don't let evil walk over you. Don't let evil defeat you. Don't be afraid of evil. Don't, don't think we, we don't have a chance of that. Don't look at it as the, the dog chasing the newspaper uh, delivery boy. You can stand up about that because you have a power. Church, we need that message right now. Now, in, in the light of that being told to us in Revelation 11, we're also given another detail that kind of, I don't know, maybe shocks us a little bit into reality, and that is as the church grows with its power as we near the end of the time, watch this, evil will grow equally as much and oppose us. Did you, did you see that? So good will grow and evil will grow. Same time. And we are introduced to a, a number system here. You probably saw that when we read it. And this period of time, this number system on this specific period of time is actually referenced in four different ways. One of those is 42 months. So something's going to happen for 42 months. Then it is also referenced as 1260 days. Now you do a little math there. You take 42 months and say an average length of a month is 30 days. 42 times 30 is what? 1260. So 42 months and 1260 are the same thing. They're the same thing. It's the same amount of time referenced in two different ways. Now, there's a couple other ways that it is referenced here and later on in the book. Another one of those is when it starts talking about three and a half years. So you've got 42 months and 1260 days and just kind of play around with that a little bit. What is all that? It is three and a half years. So three and a half years and 42 months and 1260 days, it's all referencing the same amount of time. Then there is a fourth way this period of time is referenced and it's a little tricky when you first read it and it almost doesn't seem to make sense. It says time, comma, times, plural, comma, and a half. Time, times, and a half. You think, what in the world is time, times, and a half? Watch this. Time, singular one, times, plural two, half. What is that? One plus two equals three and a half. So, 42 months, 1260 days, three and a half years, time, times, and a half, they all reference this one period of time. So now that you know those four references of this time are interchangeably used, the obvious question is, what in the world does that mean? What is that period of time? Well, the first thing I would suggest that you pay attention to is three and a half is exactly half of the perfect number seven. Remember? Seven is totality. It's complete. It is God's number. Three and a half cuts it in half. It is patterned in a way, when you think of that, that three and a half falls short of the perfect seven. So we are, we are referencing here something that is evil. 
So 42 months, 1260 days, three and a half years, time, time, time and a half. Those all reference something evil. Now, I think it's somewhat interesting when you think of three and a half as being less than seven, that there's another place in the Bible where the same thing happens. And you've heard about it. We'll dive into it deeper when we get to chapter 13, where we are told what the mark of the beast will be at that point, and it is 666. We've all heard that. And you think, what in the world is 666? And when you start playing with it, literally, it, it messes you up. I've seen people where you can, can, um, can transliterate your, the spelling of your name to a number, like A would be one and B would be two. And I've seen that where, where people of great prominence in the world, we transliterate their name to a number and it's 666 and we go, that's the Antichrist. We do all kinds of silly things with the number 666. I, I remember one time I was at a, a, a fast food place, the drive up, and my total my bill was $6.66. I almost wanted to add fries on there uh, to get away from that. And that's just, that's a silliness. 666, what is that? It is the trinity of less than seven. It is, it is the completion of of less than seven. It is the wholeness of evil. That's that's what that means. And so when you start thinking of terms that way, we we already know then that whatever this frame period of time is, three and a half years, 42 months, 1260 days, time, times and a half, that, that we're talking about something evil here. Now, another thing I want you to see, and I'm actually gonna gonna reference some of this. Um, I wanna read it for you is the image of this time frame is actually referenced back in the Old Testament. And so there we are again. This is important, this study. The images in the book of Revelation often have their keys in the Old Testament. So you go back in the Old Testament, where did that happen? So I'm going to read for you, and you can write these down. I'm going to read them real quick. Uh, a couple places in the book of Daniel. One of those is in chapter 7, uh, verses 23. Uh, through 25, Daniel 7, 23 through 25. And it's going to describe a king who is evil. And I want you to pay real close attention uh, to what it says about this king. So Revel- or Daniel chapter seven, starting in verse 23, it says, he gave me this explanation. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on earth. It'll be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. The ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. After them, another king will arise, different from the earlier ones, and he will subdue three kings, and he will speak against the Most High and oppress his saints and try to change the set times and the laws, and the saints will be handed over to him for, you ready for this, a time times and half a time. That's where it comes up in Daniel 7. It comes up again in Daniel chapter 12, verses 5 through 7. And I want you to watch this again. We again start to see in this prediction from Daniel 12 about the end of time when there will be an assault on the people of God. And so here it's predicted in this text. Let me read verse 5, 6, and 7. Then I, Daniel, looked, and there before me stood two others, one on this bank of the river and one on the opposite bank. And one of them said to the men clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, how long will it be before these astonishing things are fulfilled? And the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, lifted his right hand and his left hand toward heaven. And I heard him swear by him who lives forever, saying, It will be for a time, times, and half of time, when the power of the holy people has been finally broken, all of these things will be completed. So we know from the book of Daniel that there's going to come a time at the end of the world where there's going to be this specific time where evil will attack the children of God. And it'll last for 1260 days, 42 months, three and a half years, time, times, and half a time. Don't think of that as literal. 
think of that as a period of great evil influence upon God's people. Now, when you take it back to chapter 11, stay with me here. Now that's all starting to make sense because what we're finding happening in chapter 11 is that as we near the end of time, remember we're between the sixth and seventh trumpet, okay? As we near the end of time, the force of God's power, the children, the redeemed, the church rises in power. More and more people standing up to that which is right, opposing that which is evil. That's our responsibility right now in the interlude. And while that is happening, don't miss this, while that is happening, the force of evil will grow simultaneously. That as we near the end of time, there will be a specific period. And don't think of it as three and a half years. A specific period, however long that is, where evil is increasing and the force of good is increasing at the same time while evil is attacking good. Now, are we there? Is that where we're at right now in the year 2022? I, I can't tell you that we are. I can tell you that all signs indicate that we certainly are moving in that direction. As evil will rise with its ladder of influence, the people of God must rise at the same time. We will not cower we will not turn and run. We will not be afraid. If evil punches, we will punch. If evil kicks, we will kick. If evil screams, we will scream. The church must stand up against this. And as we near the end of the story, we will find that becoming a bigger and bigger and bigger deal. Now, you, you, you don't have to be living under a rock to see this. That it sure seems like we're, we're on the precipice of that thing. It just seems that evil and, it's, and, and, and the acceptance of evil in our society, the acceptance of that, that that just is rising and now we're at the point that when you oppose it, we are attacked by that. We're canceled because we oppose that which is evil. And so that day is coming according to the 11th chapter of Revelation. Now I want you to see something that I think is important, another detail in it, and that is, what, what is our message? What are we supposed to be saying during this period of time? What does God want us to do? And we're given a little bit of a hint in that in the third verse, where it talks about the two witnesses, the children of God, that they are prophesying, they're speaking God's word and his will, clothed in sackcloth. What does that mean? Well, sackcloth was a real material back in the Old and New Testament days. It was a coarse material. I understand they made it from goat's hair. And you generally wore something of, uh, of a sackcloth material. You actually wore it like a robe or a coat under two conditions. Number one, if you were mourning the loss of someone. So sackcloth was, you were very, very sad. The other time that sackcloth became kind of a, uh, an image about you is when you wore it while you were repenting. You were sad that you had done something in your life that was wrong and you were just broken over that. And I don't ever want to do that again. And I know that was an offense to God. And I put this sackcloth on as a portrayal to the father of my sorrow and my desire, my desire to change. That aspect of 
of repentance with sackcloth. Go back to chapter 11 in Matthew. And just write this down. You can look at it later. Matthew chapter 11, verses 20 and 21. We have an indication there, a story where sackcloth was used as a repentive type uh, sign of where your heart was. Now, we move to Revelation 11 and we find end of the, the story here. Okay, good increasing, the church becomes more powerful, evil increasing, evil attacking. So you got these two powerful forces rising up and up, and the church will prophesy in sackcloth. What's that mean? It means our message to an evil world is repentance. It's not tolerance. The thing that we say as we move toward the end of the world is that we call people to turn away from evil and turn toward God. That's what repentance means, to turn around. And that's what our message needs to be unapologetically as we move on historically in time, as these two forces, good and evil, get bigger and bigger and bigger and opposing, that what we're calling people to do without shame is to turn away from evil and toward God. That is diametrically opposed to what the world tells us because the world tells us that our message should be that of tolerance. Just accept people, no matter what they believe, no matter what they want to do, let people do their very own thing. And tolerance is what is leading to the death of absolute truth. Now, now hang with me just for a second. This is deep, but it is so important. The whole concept of tolerance that appears to be intriguing and acceptable in our culture today. Let's just all love everybody and everybody get along and do whatever. That destroys absolute truth. Truth is what, what you want at any particular moment in your life now, regardless of what your circumstances are, just what do you consider to be true? What do you consider to be right at this moment in your world? And that's okay. That's where tolerance takes us. And tolerance has destroyed the idea that there are, there are things that are right in all circumstances at all times, and there are things that are wrong in all circumstances at all times. The power of the church is that our message must be repentance, not tolerance. Now, that does not mean that we're mean about it. That does not mean that we're bullies. That does not mean that we are hateful. That does not mean that at all. That does not mean that we write people off. That doesn't mean that we, we say, I'm going to have nothing to do with you. Paul described it in the Ephesian letter with the phrase that ought to govern the church as we increase in power, move to the end of time. And he said this, learn to speak the truth in love. So we tell the truth. We don't lie. We tell the truth about what is right and what is wrong. And we do it in such a loving, sensitive, tender, caring way that it attracts people, that it draws people in to that which is right. Don't cower in fear. Don't give up your values. Stand for that which is right and call out that which is wrong in a way that draws people and not repels them. So what are some modern day applications of that? Uh, churches. Churches ought not be afraid to be the conscience of their community. We shouldn't be afraid to do that. And do it in love and grace and tenderness and sensitivity. But churches ought to be able to recognize that which is evil and call it out. That is our responsibility. Christian parents ought to be unbelievably protective of your children that they are not brought in and sucked in to the idea of tolerance in our world today. Guard against that with your kids. 
Guard against that. Christians have to be a light in a dark world so that a dark world, when it hurts, will draw because we have something that they long to have. One evening, a long, long time ago, my wife and I were in a car and we were driving to our hometown up in Illinois and we were going to visit some family there for a while. And we had to go real late at night that night. And so it was, uh, it was really dark when we were driving and we were going through a, a terrible, terrible storm. It was a downpour, lightning, thunder everywhere. And we're, we're cruising in to our, our little hometown of Danville, Illinois. And if any of you have ever been there, um, you get off Interstate 74 and where we go, uh, we get off the Georgetown Road exit. And so some of you, Who've ever been there say, I, I know what you're talking about. And we're getting off that exit, and it it is so dark because the power has been knocked out everywhere. I mean, you you can't see anything. It's one of them things if you turn the headlights off in your car, it'd, it'd be like total dark, total blindness. And it was just eerie. It was really a weird feeling. And we get off the exit, and uh, the house we're going to is two, three miles down the road. And I saw down on the road over to the right there was this glowing, this glowing in the sky. Now, what on earth? And as we got closer to that, that glow, I, I, I recognized it when we got there. And there is a church on the side of Georgetown Road, Calvary Baptist Church, wonderful church. I've been there. And apparently the power had been knocked out in that church and their generators had kicked on. And they must have had generators connected to every light in that church because every window, pretty good sized building, every window had the bright light inside of that glowing. And we were driving and I, man, I remember today, I, I said to my, my wife, I, I looked at that and I said, look at that, look at that, look at that. The church, the light in a dark world. That's chapter 11. That's what you and I do during the interlude. But friend, it will not come without a cost to us. And that cost is described in our next lesson. I hope you're back for it. Have a great day. Thanks for being here.